I was born in Greenwood, South Carolina, in my home place there at the end of West Crestville on Spring Street. The house is still there. My dad started the company. He was um, like a, a young a teenager, maybe even 12, when he started uh, uh, collecting seeds from his mother's garden and selling them to the neighbors. And it, um, being an entrepreneurial type of guy, he, uh, he started printing up a little one-page uh, sheet that sold his, listed the plants, he was, the seeds he was selling. He, he was an immensely um, prolific writer. And, uh, and he wrote all these articles and he'd, he'd have people write in letters and he'd write replies to him. Anyhow, the company grew and grew. Then he, he, uh, he had a family up there and a, and a wife and um, uh, ended up uh, retiring. And at that time, his wife had died. So he was going to retire to Florida and the seeds went, wouldn't keep in Florida, so he said it's too cold in Pennsylvania and South Carolina's got the best climate in the world. He had been corresponding with my grandmother and um, she was a county home demonstration agent and so she had written him and asked for some free seeds for her, for her farmer's wives. And he wrote back and said, well, he couldn't give any free seeds, but he had plenty of free advice. And so uh, this went on for, I don't know, two, three years. And uh, so he met her when it came down. Uh, if I'm correct, she was in her late 20s and he was in his 60s. But uh, they got married. <laughs> My dad started the company again over on the backside we had 25 acres in there. And we ran, he ran that for a few years and it was just getting going good again. And uh, he died in 1935 and mother had to run it from there on. Uh, of course, that was in the middle of the depression and uh, Gran kept the thing running. It got down to like her and two little ladies. And uh, uh, she kept it open. Uh, and running through the Depression, which was pretty amazing. <laughs> and uh, then when the, the two sons came back uh, after World War II, then they came into the company and um, ran the company after that. My brother and I decided we couldn't agree. And I sold my interest to him and uh, he ran it. It was his company from then until uh, 1967, when he and his wife were killed in the company plane. Uh, he traveled to the United States in his airplane every summer and uh, went out to California and uh, we stopped in, in places in between, saw other seed companies like in the Midwest or a bunch of them. That was great fun. And then he had this tragic accident an airplane, crash an airplane right out here at the airport. Gee, that was the toughest moment. <laughs> it was wild. Uh, his brother came back. He was his partner and then he uh, started his own nursery business. And then, well, blood is thicker than water. And he came back and uh, ran the company. And he did a wonderful job. The board asked, I understand, William John to come back. He left the company, both of them, you know, one went that way and one stayed. And um, so they asked him back. And I think the success of the company over those years can be, you know, really first and foremost put at his, put at his door. I mean, he was a very good leader. He was a disciplinarian in the right way. He was the right man for the job. And I sensed always knew what was going on in the company. And he would walk around the lot. So, you know, you would see him. And he was interested in people. He was very much a people's person as well. But at the same time, um, a strong leader. 
I got a phone call from John Nave, who was a company pilot for Abney Mills, and unfortunately gave me the hard news and wanted me to go tell my mother. But anyway, that was on a Saturday, and I went back to work Tuesday morning after the funeral. And uh, I guess we, if I had re looked at the books, I'm not sure I would have gone back because it was shaky. But fortunately, uh, we survived that and began to grow a little bit. And uh, ultimately, uh, grew into what we've got now. When I came, uh, Park Street published 180,000 catalogs. And it was, the goal was 400,000. That was the heyday of the original Park Street company, the founder of the company. He published 500,000 catalogs. 400,000, 400,000. That's right. Well, it blew up to four million <laughs> at one time. So that was, was just great going. My father was George Barrett, and he, he was a bit of an innovator, and he was one of the first in the industry to go to color pictures. And it was expensive, and it was a big gamble. And uh, that's right when he died, actually, that the year the first color book came out. And, um, uh, and Uncle William, he said, oh, we've got all this expense and all this color. Uh, and, and he died, and oh, and, but it, um, it worked out. They had a good year. We printed the first color catalog way back. Uh, we were one of the early seat companies to do that. Uh, I think the first color cover we had was a picture of a, a red petunia, which was something that they hadn't, hadn't been as of that point. And it was called Fachi. And then from that, we grew to 12 pages of color. And ultimately, we went to, to uh, all color. We printed the main catalog, which was a run of about five million. Then we had a, two spring catalog supplements, which was probably a million, million and a half. And then we had a fall catalog, which was a bulb catalog. And that probably was, I don't really remember, but probably was two million, I don't know. It, but the big catalog was, was five million. In fact, I can recall writing checks for a million dollars to the Greenwood Post. Well, either the Greenwood Post Office or the post office wherever uh, the catalogs were being mailed from the printer, because wasn't any need, to, wasn't any need to ship them down. Yeah, it's just more expense, and our post office couldn't handle that many anyway. The aesthetics of a book, a color book, are important. The catalog was the thing that, that, that attracted people. I mean, the company has always, you know, has always been to the fore. In, in the, in the mail-order marketing. While we are still, while Park Street was still located at Spring Street downtown, we started a wholesale goer day where we invited wholesale goers to look at our trials, show them the new things, and this sort of thing, of course, wasn't, uh, wasn't an original idea. Many seed companies did that too. All good seed companies have trials. And you try out the stuff that you're offering and you try out new stuff to decide whether you want to offer it or not. And that's why we call them trials. The trial garden started as a resource for our customers and our breeders. And so when grower customers would come to the trial gardens, um, they would you know, take notes and shop a nice blowout sale for the growers of, you know, containers and things like that. What we would do uh, one day a year in conjunction with uh, the Festival of Flowers. As a matter of fact, Park Seed was what got the Festival of Flowers in Greenwood started. We were, were the sponsor and we backed it all, but we would have one, one day 
during the Festival of Flowers that the, the company was open to uh, the public, and the public could come out here and buy any excess plants, bulbs, and uh, hard goods that, that we had left over. And they would be, when it first started out, they would probably be somewhere between 15, 20,000 people come out here. The first festival uh, really came about because Park Seed was about to have their 100th anniversary. So we decided, the chamber decided to have a festival in conjunction with the Grow Day. And the first one was very small. It was a weekend in July and it was all uptown. We didn't know where it was going. Back in that day, most festivals were in very small towns and they didn't, they had their own identity like, and most of them were named after food, like chitlin, peanut, peach, watermelon, whatever. And uh, so we, along with the park's influence, decided to have a flower festival. The city of Greenwood, uh, the chamber, noticed that all these people were coming from all over to Greenwood for this purpose, and so it kind of blossomed into an event for the public, um, for the area, for the whole town. Um, they just had their 50th Festival of Flowers. Now um, it's a big economic impact for the area. It took the whole place, uh, really. It, it was not a one-man job. It, it took people all over. Uh, it, was, it was very expensive. <laughs> but, uh, and it took a lot of time and effort. But it also brought a lot of people in. We'd have we'd have like ten thousand people coming in over the Flower Day weekend at the peak. I mean, it was um, it was a it was a big thing, and of course the trials were you know obviously interesting. And I would always give a talk. In fact, my own garden used to be on tour many of those in those early years as well. So I was kind of in two places. But it was yeah, I mean, it was a very positive thing for the company. George Park uh, had the idea that uh, if there was a man present on the moon, that he would like to be able to supply seed for this colony. So our first endeavor was to see if we could ship seed uh, into space without damage. And that was the uh, first one, the uh, getaway special. My nephew, George, uh, was reading in, in uh, I think it was a Scientific American or one of the publications with the information about it. And he came into my office and said, Uncle Williams, can we get on in line and hopefully get put, put something in the flight? And I said, sure. So they wanted a $3,000 deposit, which was a good faith, I guess, that you would do something. So I said, sure. And one interesting thing was building the hardware. Of course, that fell on me and I had never done anything like that before. Uh, and it had to be a certain size, you know, tall and wide. Uh, and uh, we got a company up in Anderson to uh, fabricate the, uh, the hardware. And the first go around, I had just divided it into two sections with a disc across the middle of a cylinder. And NASA told me that that wouldn't hold together, that I had to do something else. So we made a cylinder within a cylinder. And then we got down to the point where we had to do a, a static test on it. It had to uh, hold so much weight. And I had no idea how to, how to do that. And so we, we talked to NASA and they said, just set it on the floor and put weight on it. So one of the big guys uh, here in the advertising stood in the middle of that canister and then picked me up. And we went over the 350 pound limit or whatever. And since it, <laughs> since it held together, it was, it was ready to fly. I'm not quite sure how it came about. But all of a sudden, we were offered the this, 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 this seat container. It was a container about so big, and uh, we had several varieties of seats in there. We had sealed 
all the seed into uh, what we call retort pouches, uh, vacuum sealed, so they were real, real tight. And then while they were in the vacuum of space, of course that relaxed and the seed moved around and when we got them back, they were back sealed tight, but you could see the indents and everything where the seed had moved, uh, where uh, they had relaxed and the seed had uh, gravitated to a different place. The biggest thing that surprised me was, uh, was the onion seed. Onion seed is, f loses uh, germination real quick. When, but this was, uh, it was three years before we, and it germinated 40% still. So uh, uh, space is good for seeds, and I could easily see how life propagated throughout the universe. I mean, if onion seeds could survive it, <laughs> surely a few uh, one cell things or amino acids could travel through space somehow. A group from Langley, NASA, came to us and asked if we wanted to work on an experiment uh, that would involve school children. And of course, we jumped at that opportunity and that was the uh, Seeds in Space uh, project on the LDAP uh, that involved, I think, about two and a half million kids worldwide. We had, we had a big container with, I think it's about 125 different varieties of seeds, as well as, um, I don't know how many tomato seeds, but the tomato seeds were gonna be distributed to uh, school teachers who would use them in their room to grow tomatoes and see what happened. And I think we had about 125,000 teachers request them. It was a good publicity stunt. And uh, all we even made CBS news one time because when, they get, when the things came back, some stupid teacher came and thought, oh, they were contaminated. And he, when he got the seeds from space in his uh, in his classroom, he made a big show of taking that seed and taking it out and <laughs> disposing of it because he thought he would get uh, uh, mutations out of it or something. I congratulate the folks that are keeping it running for, for the last, well, I've been gone. I stepped out of the chair in 90. So we, we, settled, we celebrated 125, I guess, so I'll have to give him credit for 150. And uh, more power to him. I hope they make it another 150. Congratulations to Park Seed on making it 150 years. I saw 125 anniversary when I was here, so hopefully they can go another 150 years because it was a great company and I enjoyed working here. Well, I'd just like to congratulate Park Seed on the anniversary. Proud to see them accomplish this anniversary and continue forward. Congratulations to Park Seed for making it through 150 years. They've been 150 glorious years, ups and downs, and but uh, it's still surviving and still serving America's gardeners. I hope it continues into the future. I want to congratulate Park Seed for the 150th anniversary. I'd just like to offer my congratulations to the company on 150 years of uninterrupted service to the home gardener. Congratulations for the length of time and I hope it's another 150 years or more. To keep it on going 150 years and another 150 years to come, I wish you lots of success. <laughs>